Hey everybody, I'm live again. Uh, this is our uh, live with the great Johannes. Uh, my real name is uh, Johannes Matthijs Koenraad. Johannes Matthijs Conrad. I'm originally from the Netherlands and I like to do these live shows to practice my speaking in English. Um, I foresee that in some time in the future uh, I will play some kind of public role and I better master speech. Right? This is easier said than done, you know, you just need a lot of, uh, a lot of practice anyway. So as usual, I'm streaming on TikTok. I just got started. I will repost this whole video onto YouTube later, usually uh, the same evening. Uh, my YouTube username is also at the great Johannes, just like my TikTok is at the great Johannes. Uh, some people ask me like, what do you call yourself the great Johannes? Well, I don't think I'm great. I'm just Johannes. But you know, uh, I used to, uh, used to have a bit of a traumatic childhood. So I turned that around and make me feel better, you know? I think in this episode, I want to read to you some uh, excerpts from my book called uh, Return to Freedom. I'll get to that later. And I also want to uh, talk about uh, some more moon stuff. Uh, I'll get to that later as well. Uh, but let's start, let's start this session with uh, some talk about what's going on in Dublin. You know, I've made videos about this. Uh, in Dublin, you had a stabbing by an Algerian racist who attacked some white kids and a white teacher. Uh, the woman threw herself between the knife attacker and the children to save the children. Then some local guy, Warren Donahue, he jumped uh, onto the attacker, uh, wrestled him to the ground. And then some, uh, some kid, a French kid, Alan, took the knife away. Uh, but the mainstream media didn't tell you that. The mainstream media showed you uh, some kind of delivery driver who allegedly uh, uh, was the real hero. They catapulted him into the status of real hero, even though he was probably a passerby and he did play some role. He used his helmet to hit the attacker as well, while the attacker was already floored by the other guy, Warren Donahue. But so you see that the mainstream media make or break you. They decide who is the hero and they decide who is controversial. If they want to have a diverse hero, they will simply ignore that there were others who were also heroes, you know? Yeah. Oh, somebody, some people are moving, are coming into my comment section here, like, uh, I'm Irish and the Irish were brainwashed until now. They're kind of waking up, yeah. I suppose uh, this is happening all over Europe. You know, we're all figuring out that diversity is not a strength. Diversity is a disaster. It can lead to disaster. You know, in the Irish media, I've got, I'm looking at some articles here now, right? The Irish media, they really mainly focus on, uh, on the fact that, that there were riots and Conor McGregor, the uh, UFC fighter, if I'm correct, he also kind of rallied uh, the Irish people into action, like, come on, get up, do something, right? do something about something. And um, Conor McGregor is now under investigation. They want to uh, probably convict him of a hate speech, of hate crimes, right? So I'm reading this article. This is from The Spectator. A Dublin is on edge and things can get worse. Ireland has been a powder keg waiting to explode for quite some time. And it appears, it appears that that time is now. Yeah? You know, it's only the West that needs to wake up. Yeah, immigrants will never survive in the East. I suppose, you know, they do have a lot of mass migration going on in Asia, but it's Asian migration. So Korean people moving to Thailand or so, or, uh, you know, Thai people moving to China. It's kind of within their racial makeup, right? Whereas in, in Europe and in North America, we just accept everybody from everywhere without even checking their qualifications. Saudi Arabia started checking the qualifications of um, migrants coming out of India because you have all these genius IT experts there, right? Guess what? Not even 5% of the candidates tested were able to do what they said they, they were supposed to do based on their resumes. Uh, meaning they come there to code, to write software. Only 5% of them could actually write software. The others couldn't even do it. So uh, Saudi Arabia is clever in that sense. Why don't we do that in the Western world? Why don't we Western people also, uh, you know, check the qualifications of the people we let into our countries? This is, re this is really bizarre, you know. So I'm reading from, uh, from The Spectator again. You know, at 1.30 p.m. last Thursday, a horrific knife attack was perpetrated outside a school on Parnell Street in Dublin's north inner city. Three children and an adult female were stabbed by the Algerian racist attacker. I, I call him racist now because, you know, why shouldn't we? 
Why shouldn't we? You know, the problem is that we keep calling these attacker, attackers like lone wolves or mentally ill, but maybe they're just racist. They're just racist who hate white people. Some people find that very hard to imagine. Uh, someone asks, do you think what's happening in Ireland is going to lose traction? No, I don't think so. This is an expression of something bubbling up. Uh, it's been going on for a long time, of course, mass migration, the trouble, and also the media denial of the crimes committed against the majority, the native Europeans, you know. And that's a real problem, you know. Uh, someone asked, did, did you read what I've said? No, uh, this is the first comment I see of you. Just a minute. I got these trolls in my comment section. I just block them. Goodbye, you know. So uh, here, the attacker who has now been confirmed to be an Algerian male who acquired Irish citizenship and has been living in the country for the last 20 years. Yeah, who cares, right? Who cares? I mean, after 20 years, he still hates you. That's, that's the message, really. We don't seem to take note of that, you know. Uh, I didn't look at Telegram today. So Dublin's north inner city has long been known as bandit country. Really? <laughs> How come you haven't done anything about it? That sounds like Sweden. Sweden has these areas in Malmo, for example, uh, that are just terrorist country. So North, North Dublin apparently is bandit country. Having seemingly been abandoned by successive governments, this part of the city, which stretches into Dublin's main thoroughfare, thoroughfare of O'Connell Street, has spent the last few years descending into a seemingly never-ending cycle of decay and despair. You think somebody will do something about it, right? Yeah? You think someone will do something about it? This is weird, man. Like, drug dealing, I'm reading the article, drug dealing is openly performed on the streets of Dublin. Muggings, assaults, and car thefts are now so ubiquitous that they don't even make the news anymore. It's rare to see a policeman on the street. This sounds just like Sweden. This is going on in so many places, in like some of the suburbs in Paris as well but not in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is still fine. It's just the Western North, especially the Northwest European nations, they've let in so many people and then there's no checks and balances. Nobody cares what they do, right? And then when there is crime, the police seem to retreat rather than engage with the, with the crime, right? So the war between Kinahan and the Hutch gangs stretched resources to breaking point and resulted in an almost complete lack of street level policing. Yeah, you know, this is Dublin today, you know? This is weird. I'm going to be answering questions that people uh, give me on, uh, on the live chat here. So someone asks that you said there will be a war between Europe and Africa. Yeah, obviously. If you speak to the Central Africans, they absolutely hate Europe and they want revenge. Now, as soon as countries like Nigeria modernize themselves, what happens? They become more modern. They get more of the wealth, right? This will happen anyway, right? But then they're also going to acquire military capacity. And how are they going to use that? Imagine... Nigeria have the military capacity of Russia. What would Nigeria do with it? Well, they're going to destroy Europe. They're going to go to war with Europe. So we have to prepare for that, you know. Well, let's go on. So lots of people are so upset about the things I say, and it's largely because what I say is just very close to the truth. I don't claim that I know the truth all the time, but I, I get really close to it. And this, oh, this makes people feel very, very, very awkward and uncomfortable sometimes. And that's just how it is, you know. Someone's bike cut stolen. You got it back? Okay, that's freaking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you from Ireland for exposing the truth and what the government is doing to us. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's sad. Ireland is a good example, but it's, it's definitely happening, happening all, around, uh, all around Europe, you know. Do you think there's hope for nations like Sweden or is it too late for multiculturalism? Yeah, Sweden has actually started deporting people. So if this is the tipping point, you know, if Sweden can start sending people back, then we all can. You know, there's no reason not. There's no technically no technical reason why we can't do that. Uh, it's just a political reason that we're not doing it yet. But we, if Europe decides to mass deport uh, millions of people who have no uh, no purpose in Europe, we can just do that today. You know. Subsequently, I'm reading the article again. Subsequently, subsequently however, Garda Commissioner Drew Harris has refused to rule out that possibility. All right meaning that there were a, terror, a terrorist motive behind the atrocity, behind the stabbing in, uh, in Dublin. And that's, you know, it's more than terrorism. It can simply be racism. Why don't we ever call migrants racist? They are often just as racist as everybody else, sometimes even more. You know, you can't 
pin this on mental illness. You don't see people going mentally ill and then, oh, let's go stab children. Not if it's not every time, not when every time you see people do that, it's immigrants doing it. You know, we saw that in a, in a playground in France as well uh, a while ago. So as the attacker is still in hospital, recovering, recovering from wounds inflicted on him by bystanders who intervened to prevent any more children from being stabbed, it will take some time before the exact reasons become clear. <laughs> the reasons are clear. You know, you have a Muslim migrant who hates white people. That's the reason. Come on, you know. Within hours, matters took a turn for the worse. The initial group of right-wing anti-immigrant demonstrators were joined by hundreds of locals and the worst riots Ireland's capital has ever witnessed truly began in earnest. So this is what they worry about, about people responding to the crimes being committed against you know, the majority. What had, in the afternoon... Uh, been seen as a terrible attack on innocent children quickly became a full-on citywide panic. Yeah, of course, you know, diversity doesn't work. You put so many people together, you know, then eventually this is going to happen. What, did you, what else did you expect? Diversity was never a strength, you know. <laughs> a carriage or, or a public tram car was torched Numerous buses were vandalized and set ablaze. Even a Garda patrol car was set on fire as rioters then began looting shops. Well, you know, they just, they just told you that uh, there is no police oversight in large areas of Dublin because the police apparently doesn't dare to go there. No wonder people take it out on the police, right? You're, you are supposed to protect people. And if you're not doing your job because you don't like to arrest foreigners or immigrants, you know, people take note. People notice this, you know. Yeah, someone answers here. I'd be more worried if there wasn't a national outrage. Yeah, then people would be really, really, you know, timid or tame. At least the Irish show you that you can just go out and push back and fight back. Oh, by the way, I have to mention for legal reasons, I don't support violence. I don't support you actually going out and destroying things. Don't do that, right? But they take everything out of context. Like, uh... Conor McGregor, that's the, the fighter, right? And he, he actually said something like, if the government uh, rem tries to uh, like remove you from your home to make room for immigrants, you should, you should torch your home. I thought that was a very powerful statement. And he added, we're at war. It's a very powerful statement because it implies that, you know, uh, we don't have to go, we natives in Europe, we don't have to go along with our replacement immigration. immigration. If we can't live here, you know, then no one can live here. Someone, uh, someone from the Netherlands uh, said it this way. If we can't live here, if we, can't, if we Dutch people, the natives can't live in the Netherlands, we should just blow up the dikes and drown the country. You know? That's maybe a, a very violent thing to say, but don't you think that is the logical outcome if, of pushing uh, replacement immigration onto, uh, onto the well, former majority in certain areas in Europe? I think so, you know? So, I'm reading the article more. Tellingly, the largest bookstore in the country, Essence, which has its flagship store 100 yards away from the center of the riots on O'Connell Street, remained untouched. <laughs> okay. You know, maybe people are, don't care about bookstores so much. Right? But, of course, this article is too long to read the whole thing, but I want to move on to something from Fox News over here. Uh, is it Ireland is now pushing an anti-hate law in the wake of the Dublin riots, not because the migrants stabbed children, no, but because people responded to the stabbing because the police didn't do enough, right? Ireland wants to criminalize memes and even uh, poses free speech concerns. Elon Musk slammed these, these hate speech laws. Hey, it's Philip van Hout in my... Uh, in my uh, live here. Philip van Hout is, uh, is a Belgian uh, pundit or some sort. You know, isn't it hilarious that they are surprised an anti-immigration party in the Netherlands won? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we weren't surprised. The people are fed up, you know. All right. I hope something will change in the Netherlands, but it has to change all over Europe, in every, every European country, especially Western Europe. You know, this is just truly problematic, you know. No. 
The Irish Ireland's government is newly pushing an anti-hate speech law in the wake of riots because they're more worried about the natives' response to crimes committed against the majority rather than actually doing something about the crimes. They just want to slap the natives with hate speech laws, hate speech uh, programs. Now, this is really weird. You know, so language being proposed as law in Ireland means this could literally happen to you for having a meme on your phone. You know, it says Elon Musk. Like, they want to make it so that you aren't even allowed to possess uh, a hate speech a meme gif or jpeg on your phone right because you're you're not allowed to own this like they're going to equate a picture of pepe saying something silly uh with you having a copy of mein kampf in your pocket or something like that right so uh, they want to protect people based on all sorts of characteristics this is the usual stuff they say that oh um being transgender or for example or your national or ethnic origin is all protected, meaning you're not allowed to mention it. When I say that the attacker was an Algerian racist, I'm not allowed to say that. I could get a I could get a hate speech uh, infringement in Ireland if I if I said that the attacker was from Algeria. It's really not about discriminating against people of certain uh, backgrounds. What it's really about. What it's really about is that you're not allowed to mention them. You're not allowed to say that the attacker was from Algeria. You're not, you're not allowed to say that they are immigrants or that they are this or that or that a transgender mass shooter killed like dozens of people in the USA. You're not allowed to mention that they were this or that because then people might wake up. You know, the general idea is that uh, people who watch CNN think that mass shooters in the USA are predominantly white men when in reality they are black men. There are more black male mass shooters in the USA this year, last year, year before that, and so on. But they don't show you that, so they paint a different picture. People are misinformed. Yeah, the most hateful thing you can do with speech is to prohibit it. Yeah. So uh, this is an article from Fox News, you know. Uh, I think Leo Varadkar is their prime minister of Ireland, and he's going to pass this new law. And he gave a speech uh, Friday. I think it's now very obvious to anyone who might have doubted us that our incitement hatred legislation, legislation is not up to date, Varadkar said. It's not up to date for the social media age, and we need that legislation through, and we need it through in a matter of weeks. They're so terrified. Because it's not just the platforms who have a responsibility here, and they do. There's also the individuals who post messages and images online that stir up hatred and violence. And we need to be able to use laws to go after them individually as well. The European Union also kind of planned something like this, right? The European Union said that if TikTok or Twitter, X and so on, don't want to play by the rules of the EU, they can be shut down. They can literally be uh, you know, blacklisted from serving people living in the EU. At first, I hoped that the EU meant to use this kind of legis legislation to actually curb a lot of the Islamist hatred for native Europeans, meaning a lot of Islamists are in their own WhatsApp groups, you know, stirring up hatred against the natives to try to get us killed. But no, that's not exactly what they're going to use these laws for. They're going to mostly primarily use these laws to shut native Europeans up who are complaining about their replacement immigration. E euthanasia, very well said. <laughs> yeah, parts of France aren't even French anymore. No, it's really uh, turning into Africa, right? Turning into Central Africa, you know. What's the religion of the European Union? Well, officially, it's Christianity. I don't know if they swear on the Bible. Probably not, because the leaders of the EU in Brussels tend to be communists, right? atheist communists. So they're going to pass this, this really bizarre law in, uh, in Ireland. That if I would be living in Ireland, I probably would not be able to speak anymore on my TikTok views or something. So I hope to uh, navigate this landscape a little bit and uh, be safe, you know. Ireland's support for nationalist parties is so low, I don't get it, you know, especially after the riots. Yeah. I suppose a lot of people, this is normal, they vote for their self-interest. So they vote socialist thinking that they're going to get a raise or they're going to get cheaper housing. That's what they want. People want affordable housing and so on. 
So they're not necessarily going to vote against immigration or open borders unless it's made clear to them that that is the reason why housing is no longer affordable. And a lot of people still don't get that. Although in the Netherlands, they woke up. A, a good portion of the Netherlands, like one in five Dutch people gets it now. They vote right wing. They figured out, okay, this is the reason why we can't have housing in our own country anymore. Because we, we're filling all the available housing, the subsidized housing, with immigrants. There are places in the Netherlands, entire neighborhoods, where you have like half of the people are getting subsidized housing are immigrants. Whereas the natives living right next door, they pay like 1,200 euros a month just to live there. That's unfair. It's totally unfair. But I spoke about this uh, in my last uh, live show as well. Here, let me read from, uh, this is from the, uh, uh, the European Union also has a bill, or is this the Irish one? No, can't make out which is this. Okay, the bill states that racism and xenophobia are direct violations of the principles of liberty, democracy, respect for human rights, and fundamental freedoms and the rule of law. Principles upon which the European Union is founded are really, and which are common to the member states. Yeah. This is a lie, of course. See, you see what they're doing? They're going to pass a hate speech laws, but the only thing they care about is that you can't say anything about transgenders, you can't say anything about immigrants, you can't say anything about people who are actually different. They're, they're focusing on the racism and the xenophobia and the so-called transphobia, which is a complete fiction that's made up, right? But, they're, but why? What they're really doing is, we want to replace you and you locals, you natives, you may, you may still be the majority today, but we don't want you to be the majority anymore. We're going to make you a minority in your own countries. You just have to swallow it, accept it, put up with it. And you know what? We're going to slap you with fines and jail sentences, like years in jail for saying you don't like immigrants stabbing your children. Now, it's now racist to say that you don't like terrorists killing your children. That's what we are now. That's where it is now. And one of the punishable crimes from the article relating to xenophobia is merely the commission of an act referred to in point by public dissemination or, contribu or, or distribution of tracts, pictures, or other material. So if you are on Twitter and you retweet a Pepe meme about a migrant, you are already punishable. You are, you are already committing a, a crime in the, under this situation. You know how how dystopian this is going to be. This is like 1984, but worse. It's way worse. Way, way worse. So here, Irish citizens could soon be jailed for possessing material likely to incite violence or hatred. Okay, you know, this is absurd. Uh, why are we putting up with this? Here, uh, I guess Elon Musk is kind of pushing back, but you know, whose side is Elon Musk really on? You know, <laughs> it can be a real bit or a bit, a bit, a bit paranoid. He does say a lot of a lot of really good things. He's not so he's not like Jordan Peterson. He's better than way better than Jordan Peterson, right? Elon Musk is kind of one of ours, right? He's pushing back. He's exposing. He's really he does seem to be committed to truth finding, and that's very laudable. It's very important. <laughs> Someone has a Murdoch Murdoch shirt. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I no, you can't wear that. Technically, that is incitement to hatred, especially if there's like text on it. You know, <laughs> you could get jailed under these laws. Yeah, it's just it's just so bizarre. Uh, you know, I just that's just something I wanted to discuss about Ireland. You know. Uh, I have some other things to talk about while I see. Uh, let's see if I can also respond more to the comment section here. Uh, you know, uh, on TikTok, I got called mentally ill quite often today because I dared to question whether or not the Apollo moon landings were real. Uh, <clears throat> but I happen to be the sort of person, when you do that to me, I understand something. First of all, it's your projection. You feel mentally ill because people doubt your religion. I call, I call it the religion of technology. In a way, you can imagine that Neil Armstrong walking on the moon is technology's reenactment of Christ's resurrection. You put a man on the moon, right? He goes to heaven, right? And he comes back, renewed, a new man. And if I then question that, if you make, make it your religion, you know, you'll feel really bad about it. 
But I wanted to show you some pictures. I've set something up here that is kind of like the, uh, the smoking gun. And I'll leave it up to you to decide if you believe it or not. I mean, it, it's just that when people attack me for exposure, for trying to, trying to figure out the truth, I actually don't stop. You know, you, you telling me that you can't be friends with me anymore because, uh, because I don't believe your religion, then we're just not going to be friends anymore. You know, and that's, <laughs> I, I'm that walk away type, just like Trump. You know, you don't want to be friends with me anymore. I don't want to be friends with you anymore, you know. So I'm going to put up my, uh, my image system over here. Look at this picture. This is picture. This is a picture made on Earth, right? But because the sun is so far away, it means that the shadows on Earth are all uh, aligned, perpendicular. Is that the right word? Well, by aligned, I mean, if you see the, uh, the shadow of this post over here, it points in that direction, right? This is obvious, right? And you see the tree, same thing, right? And you see the guy further away over there. His shadow, because the, moon, the, the sunlight is so far away, the source of the light is so far away, uh, there is almost no uh, divergence of the shadows. But this is not the case, apparently, on the moon. Well, it should be. Of course, it should be the same on the moon. But here you see a picture from NASA. This is an official photograph that NASA claims was made on the moon. But there's a problem with this picture. I don't know if you can already see it or on your... Uh, on your TikTok screen where I'm streaming this. Uh, the moon lander over here, this is the moon lander, right? It has a shadow, but the shadow goes clearly in that direction. And let me underscore that a little bit, like so. The shadow goes in this direction, right? But now look at the rocks in the foreground. The shadow of these rocks points in a totally different direction. In fact, it may be a bit messy like so, like so. This is weird. This is really weird. In fact, this is impossible. Uh, someone asked me to zoom this a little bit. Let's see if I can get this right. Oh, I can move it. No, cancel. All right, move this around a little bit if I can do this. No. So the point here is these shadows should have been aligned on the moon, if, if the, the shadows are cast from the light source that is supposed to be the sun, then these shadows should be aligned, but they're not. And this is a problem. It means that this is actually recorded somewhere in a huge hangar or outside somewhere, but there is a floodlight. There is a sort of artificial light over here that casts light in that direction and also in that direction. And so you get this massive divergence of the shadows. This picture proves that it was not taken on the moon. It was taken in a studio with a floodlight. But let's move on. There are some people who tell me that they don't believe that the Americans had the ability to fake the moon landing. But of course they did. Here you see a, a crane carrying an actual moon lander module. This would be the bottom part is what they would leave behind on the moon. And the bottom part is what the upper part is what they would then use to go back, right? So they had everything in place basically. Here, watch this picture. Have you ever seen this picture before? Have you ever seen this picture before? This is a picture from 1969. And what do you see here? They have a giant mock up of a moon. So what they did was they took really good pictures of the moon surface and then projected that onto this uh, moon screen. But Notice what you see in the bottom right corner. These are monorails, rails for a camera system. Do you think they might have used something like this to fake the approach of the moon, of the lunar module, of the Apollo module? Watch this. This is a very blurry picture. Have you any idea what this is? This is a still photo from the live broadcast of 1969. And what you see here, the white part is supposed to represent the moon, right? But for a few frames, while they're, they're filming this, a few frames of this, the camera swings to the top right and reveals something weird. Again, this here below, if you can see that, is the moon, or what they say is the moon. But what the hell is this up here? Do you see these beams? What's that? What are these beams? Well, you've seen them before. You saw them in the picture I showed you over here. In the top right corner, you see these beams that are there to hold the mock-up moon in place. 
So whether you believe this or not, here, you see it again, it's these beams. It's not a lens flare. This is fake. The, when they showed you live the so-called uh, Apollo module approaching the moon, they were just recording it right here, the same way that later George Lucas would start producing his Star Wars movies. They faked it. You know? It's just totally fake. Oh, here, look. This picture shows you, uh, this is that moon, mo the fake mock-up moon. Here, the bigger one on the left. Where you have, you have a projector on the inside that projects the photographs outwardly so that you have that, uh, that moon surface, the pretend fake mock-up moon surface. You know, I'm not playing music today. Or, uh, for the past few times I, when I live streamed, I, I was playing music in the background. But I noticed that it, it gives me copyright strikes. But I noticed it's also difficult to uh, cut uh, clips from my live stream if I want to reuse them for my TikTok, for example. So that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick, yeah. That's what I... It's just so clear as, clear as night and day that Stanley Kubrick filmed the moon landings. You know, it's really not that hard to figure this out. But I, I suppose what's really going on is to many people, the moon landings have become their religion. Technology is the religion now. And of course, the, uh, the effect of seeing Neil Armstrong on the moon is far stronger than reading a history book, than reading the Bible about Christ or something, right? It's about the strength of the impression. And the impression of the moon landings is out, out, um, sorry, exceeds that of what Christianity could do, you know? NASA, in some sense, is like the Vatican. It is the, it's, it's technology's Vatican. It's the Valhalla of technology. There we can go to the moon, right? But I don't believe it anymore. So you can, you can make up your own mind. Like I said, until recent, until a few years ago, I believed the moon landings were real. I didn't doubt it. I saw this beautiful documentary. Someone made a documentary where they have the footage of the moon rover uh, driving around on the moon. That's an HD footage, by the way. And it looks so real. You want it to be real. You wish you were there, right? You know, I wanted to be an astronaut as a teenager. I believed all this stuff. But I don't believe it anymore. <laughs> yeah, what do I think about the Indian people who say they went to the moon? Well, they didn't send people, right? They sent a robot or... A, um, I don't know if it was real. If it, maybe it's possible that they were s simply taking the Mickey out of the Americans, like showing them, like, hey, hey, we know what you did. <laughs> we know what you did. The same thing happened after 9 11. A ton of buildings in Latin America suddenly caught fire, but none of them collapsed. Like they knew, like the leadership of Latin American nations, they all knew, like, hey, hey, <laughs> we see you. We see you. We see what you did, you know. International Space Station is probably real, it's, but it's, it's floating still kind of on the edge of Earth orbit. It's not actually in space, you know. It's not like the, that it could veer off into space and get lost or something. It's still, still within, within the grip of Earth, Earth gravity, of course, you know. I do think the space station, the International Space Station is real uh, in the sense that it, it is still in the atmosphere or the, at the edge of Earth's atmosphere or somewhere, you know. Do I believe in aliens? No, I have no reason to believe they're real, you know. Uh, thank you for watching my stream, by the way. Some people give me a, someone give me a donut. <laughs> awesome. Oh, if you want to subscribe and stay in the loop with whatever I'm working on, you can go to my uh, Substack newsletter at uh, www.jmk.info. That's just my newsletter. Uh, I got my... Uh, my YouTube channel at The Great Johannes, all right? What about Mars? Yeah, I, I actually for a long time fantasized about visiting Mars. I wish it can be real. I want this to be real. You know, I'm not the sort of person who believes that uh, that the whole solar system is a, is a hoax or something. I'm not like that. I want this to be true that we can actually visit Mars or fly around Venus or actually go to the moon. But the thing with the moon thing is the Americans originally wanted to go to the moon to develop the capacity to dominate the Earth from space. Imagine you could have your rockets install installed on the moon. You can have nuclear facilities on the moon with rockets pointing at Russia and China. You would, you would be all powerful. You would be godly powerful. But they never did that for a strange reason. Maybe they never went there. Maybe that's the reason why it didn't work. But, you know... Uh, we still have a lot of conventional warfare going on. 
right? The, con the conflict between Russia and Ukraine would not have existed had the U.S. actually had nuclear rockets on the moon that were able to be fired back onto Earth and hit Russia and hit, hit China. So you have to wonder why didn't they do that? If they say they had the technology to dominate the Earth from space, but then they decided not to. It's a bit weird, huh? Suspicious. Uh, I suppose what I, what I worry about is that the United States has exaggerated its actual technological capability. It has exaggerated its military capability to a point where it's become ludicrously fantastical. And we in Europe are told that the U.S. will protect us against Russia and, and against China. Of course, not really, because under the U.S. pressure, Europe has had to open up its borders. And we are flooding Europe with immigrants that are fleeing wars basically commanded by the USA. When you say NATO wages wars, it's, it's the U.S. telling NATO what to do. And that's a problem to me. I don't want Europe to be uh, in the situation where uh, we have to rely on the U.S. protection, but they're not actually protecting us. They bombed the Nord Stream. The Turk Stream is next. There's another pipeline from Russia that flows through Turkey in, and that feeds Hungary and Bulgaria, for example. Now they're eyeing to bomb that one as well. This is very problematic. If the United States is actually actively bombing our infrastructure, then they are committing acts of war against us. Basically, they're just using Europe as an arena to do whatever they want with it to serve their own interests, but at our own expense. Someone asks what this flag is about. This is just my logo for my podcast. This is the, uh, the Viking Raven, Odin's Raven, flying up into the air toward victory, into the wind to toward victory. The old Danes used to have a version of this one, a triangular flag with this bird on, on their ship, on their Viking boats. So the, the bird would be flying up into the wind toward victory. Uh, but I added the flames. I designed the flames myself. And this is just my logo for my podcast now. But hey, who knows? Maybe one day it will be something more meaningful. Yeah. What's my opinion on Serbia? Uh, is that Serbia has Belgrade, Belgrade, right? Belgrado is your capital. Yeah. I spent one day in Belgrado once. I drove through it, basically. Uh, I don't know much about Serbia, but I think, uh, I think well, good to have you, you know? Just like the Croatians as well. Good to have you. It's not like we, uh, we don't like you. <laughs> You're part of Europe. It's very important that we have all these small nations. You know, we need to start working together on a level that we have never done before. This is very important to me. You know, you've learned that our entire reality is fake. In some way it is, right? I was reading this, this book. You know, where do you think the idea of a universe even came from? Do you think that the scientists looked through their telescopes and discovered that the universe was real? No, it came from an occult book written by uh, Hermes Trismegistus, the Corpus Hermeticum. Someone, someone just made it up, and then later the scientists claimed to have discovered it. And that's why, you, you know, also the idea of a solar system came from Copernicus, or the idea that other stars are like, like the sun with planets of their own. That came from Giordano Bruno. But they all made this stuff up long before scientists say that they, that they could see these things with their telescopes, which is weird. Either these sages, these, exactly, it's all Kabbalah nonsense. In, in a way, you're right about that. You know, the Kabbalists, they, they imagined these things first, and then somehow, magically, centuries later, the scientists claimed to have verified these imaginations. And that's just unlikely. It's unlikely as hell. Well, you can say that they are right, these occultists, but you can't prove that they were right. It's more like they imagined something and then they got scientists to simply validate what they wanted to see. And that is a bit of a problem, you know? I mean, you, you need to figure out, right? The original word was cosmos, yeah, but they, you know, the word universe implies one singular hermetically sealed body with everything in it right yeah it's just philosophical you know hey i uh i sometimes wrote i have written books in the past and i've published some books so uh i want to put this one on screen it's called return to freedom this is one of the earliest books i wrote the ones i'm kind of proud of because i wrote this on a dumb phone with my thumb typing in short messages it's not a real story or a book or something it's more like aphorisms and short 
uh, brief statements. And I suppose uh, to fill up the next 20 minutes of this uh, live show, I want to... I want to do something like this, yeah. You know, you can see planets with the naked eye. You can see uh, Saturn, uh, Mercurius, Venus, Mars. Uh, I, I suppose there's supposed to be six total, I suppose. Anyway, you can see a bunch of planets with the naked eye, so you didn't need telescopes for that. Uh, the planets distinguish themselves from stars in the night sky because they have an uh, awkward movement. They don't move with the stars. They move differently. And so that is why people began philosophizing about, okay, what does that mean, right? But the problem with this is you can interpret these movements in many different ways, but we only settled on the one way that science says is the one real way, and that's the problem. So I want to read from my... Uh, I, wanna just, I just want to read some pages of my book. This is chapter 5, The Search for Humanity. What do Nietzsche's Übermensch, the overman, the Hollywood superman, and socialism's new man each have in common? Well, each of these philosophies assumes there is something inherently wrong with our humanity. And the proposed solutions require us to destruct ourselves in favor of something new, idealized, in favor of some new idealized humanity. Rather than looking for solutions within, we seek salvation in some externalized savior or fantasized utopia. But there is nothing wrong with our humanity, only with our suppression of it. If we allow ourselves to feel more, to feel more and think less, we can overcome the problems humankind faces. We can stop doubting ourselves and embrace our capacity for resilience. So my whole book, this book on screen is like this. It's like short paragraphs or those sorts of, uh, those sorts of uh, ideas and thoughts. Like here's one. The true meaning of the story of Jesus Christ is not that Christ died for our sins, but if if he were among us today, we would be like the Romans killing him. I think I came up with this while I was hiking in Chamonix somewhere in France, near the, the tallest mountain in Europe, the Mont Blanc. And I was looking at the Mont Blanc from another hill, adjacent, across of it, uh, looking over this valley. And I simply have this, this sensation that the story of Christ is trying to tell us that if the Son of God were to walk on earth with us today, we wouldn't recognize him as such. We would think of them, think of them possibly as some kind of loser or a nerd or something. And we would, we would probably be the ones hurting him, right? And that, that is telling in the sense that I think that we people get too much wrong. We are just, we're not paying attention to what's really going on in the world. That's my point there. There's no such thing as a universal humanity. There's only yours and mine. And what happens when we meet? Uh, I like this saying because, what do you call this? Is this an aphorism or something? I don't know what this is really. It's just two lions. I like it because I don't believe in universal humanity myself. Uh, universalism is a lie. It's, it's something made up by people to try to create this uh, universal humanity, one universal language. We have a universal mythology, a universal origin, universal religion. You know, it just doesn't add up in my view. Do you believe we know how Jesus looked? I have no idea, you know. There are some descriptions in the Bible that say that he had uh, white hair like a sheep, uh, woolly hair like a sheep wool, and some people interpret that as meaning frizz hair. I don't think so. Woolly sheep sheep hair is not like a frizz of the of the Africans, you know. Uh, and they describe him having fiery eyes. So you make of that what you want. Fiery eyes. And uh, some people say that the fire actually means the blue fire of a candle. The center of a, f a candle fire can be bluish, right? So that maybe he had blue eyes and blonde hair. Maybe that's what, uh, what they're trying to tell us, you know. But Christ, in the end, is, a, is an archetype. Um, people have the right to depict him as they want him to be, right? And so the American Christ looks like an Aryan Superman, whereas the European Christ traditionally has always been depicted as a somewhat Middle Eastern figure. Uh, but the, the American Christ is very manly. The European Christ is more feminine, right? Life is not supposed to have some pre-cooked meanings. There's no paint by numbers road to happiness, nor are we supposed to be happy all the time. Instead, human beings came into this world with the capacity to face 
fight and defeat adversity. But when we merely go through the motions of a consumerist lifestyle, never confronting real danger, hunger, or physical threat, i.e. the five-star resort life, then we become chronically depressed. We weren't born for the easy life. Our difficulty to achieve happiness lies in the lack of struggle. Without struggle, man is nothing. It is in the continued struggle against meaninglessness that we have come to know our strength. Humankind is the force that stops the nothing from consuming all life. Have you ever watched The Chosen? No, I don't know it. Sports reduce athletes to pets. Sit, run, jump, lie down, roll over. Well done. Here's your medal. Here's your cookie. We go to war when we are hungry. We make love when we are content. We dream when we are tired. And we revolt when we feel wronged. Yeah, that's Ireland, right? Dublin. <clears throat> People, I mean, how, how much... How much shit can we, you know, major members of the European majority, the natives, how much shit can we take before we actually feel so wronged that we're going to take charge and do something about something, you know? Is the butterfly as aware of us as we are of it? To us, the butterfly signals the beginning of spring. To the butterfly, we are but tree stumps, a human tree stump. You know, if you stretch your arms out, how is a butterfly supposed to figure out that you're not a tree? You know? This may be a bit weird, but sometimes I write about things like that. I try to see things from different perspectives, including the perspective of animals and insects. Like, how, how do they look at the world? You know? Do you think immigration is okay as long as the migration is not too culturally different? Uh, you know, the problem is mass migration of people who are all the same, who have nothing really to offer to the societies that they are going to. Look at Malmo, look at um, Sweden, look at Ireland, Dublin. There are now so many places where you have these migrant enclaves full of people who are just living a criminal lifestyle. They're not contributing to the economy. Why can't we in Europe simply take charge of our own destiny and decide who we want to live with? What's so hard about that? It just, it's just weird. Ask any human being about their rights and they will defend them as unalienable, God-given and etched in stone. But if we, could, if we could ask horses to respect our rights, they would look up in stupefying surprise and then the, burst into hysterical whinny. Again, here I'm looking through the perspective of horses. When horses look at us as humans, what do they see? You know? They don't believe in our, our laws and rights. It's all very different. Here I've got a short story. So traveling Eastern Europe, I came across many stray dogs and walking along a trail uh, leading through the Seiso forest in Thessaloniki, Greece, uh, one of them blocked my path. The narrow trail left no room for the both of us to pass at the same time. Under normal conditions, I would expect a confident dog to have run straight at me. But as we approached each other, this dog visibly succumbed to fear. Letting, it, letting its ears hang down and backward, uh, the dog lowered his head in shame. It then walked half a circle around me through the high grass. I didn't yet understand what had made this dog so shy. Later, walking through the outskirts of the capital city of Tirana, now in Albania, I found a whole pack of dogs resting in the sun on concrete pavement. These dogs appeared even less confident. The look in their eyes betrayed a psychological humility, but I had not threatened them in any way. These dogs were careful not to bark or come close to humans. Staring one in the eye, I frightened it and it ran off. I eventually discovered what had happened to these dogs. Everywhere they went, their presence irritated the locals that had no time to attend to them, the stray dogs, let alone feed them. Some of the locals habitually kicked small rocks at them to get rid of them. Conditioned by evolution to seek the companionship of humans, these dogs evidently suffered the greatest psychological rejection, perhaps to the point of doubting their self-worth. Am I not lovable as a dog? Am I not good enough as a canine, as a pet? 
in a sense, these dogs had been dehumanized. What we so selfishly call humanity may represent something broader, some underlying psyche that all mammals share. These dogs prove to me that no one can love someone else without having been loved first. Our capacity for love, for caring and giving, depends on the unconditional positive regard we seek from our peers, and in the case of dogs, from humans too. Without it, we suffer from social exclusion. This means that some animals may be more human than humans. Some animals may be more human than humans. I think that's a very wonderful statement because some people are just animals, right? Like the Algerian racist who stabbed the children in Dublin. Um. If you want to subscribe to my newsletter, you can go to www.jmk.info, jmk.info. The question, what's the meaning of life, is the wrong question. Life doesn't have a meaning. Life gives meaning. It is life that asks us what our meaning is. Through our actions, we give meaning to the universe. People shape their environment as much as their environment shapes them back. The purpose of life is to give meaning to the universe. There's no high and low in terms of humanity. While that doesn't make us equal, it levels us. The only acceptable hierarchy dissolves itself after its members secure the specific mutual benefit. Those that call on their place in such a hierarchy as evidence of some perceived social status or worth, e.e., e.g. their royal highness, highness, deserve to live on their knees. I believe so. Here I described it. I believe hierarchy is necessary for human survival, but once a certain benefit or you know, goal has been achieved, the hierarchy should not remain, meaning I don't believe in codified hierarchies that have to be so because, because dot, 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 because no real reason can be given for it. In fact, human hierarchies can only be useful toward the achievement of a goal. Once the goal has been achieved, the hierarchy basically dissolves itself. That's how I see it, at least. Friends don't take you for granted. They value you for who you are. And if you wish to keep them, neither should you take them for granted. But never mistake feigned friendship for real friendship. The latter makes you feel stronger. The former feigned friendship friendship makes you feel as if you owe others more than you can give and that's not true right i would have a hard time describing my religious beliefs but i generally believe that there is free will and that we human beings can use that to shape our reality and in terms of god i think god is the source of that free will so some people say that we don't have free will. You can drill a hole in my skull and say, oh, there's no free will there. Where's your free will brain part? You know, I don't have a free will brain part. But I think God is a source of free will and we can use that or tap into it to use it to create, to shape our reality, really. We just happen to be living in a time where people don't believe in God anymore. People, we started building these massive cities. You know, after the industrial age came the urbanization age. And now we're in the, we're stuck age. <laughs> we're stuck in these big cities that we built. Most people in the Western world now live in cities and we don't really like it, do we? No, but there's a way out. We just have to change our program, uh, do it differently, do something else. You know, uh, thank you. A someone comments. They like what I have to say. Yeah. Can Europe rebuild Christendom? Yeah. Christianity is the one thing we ever have that united the Europeans because otherwise we don't even have a shared history. And it's important that we have some foundation to work together with on, yeah? All right, I'm running out of things to say again and I've learned not to drag things out then. So um, to cap this off, to uh, finalize this, I want to tell you that you can always go to my uh, my YouTube or TikTok at The Great Johannes. Get my subscription at uh, www.jmk.info. And uh, see you next time. I'm going to probably try to get people on the show, maybe do some interviews or so. All right, so we'll see how that goes. All right, have a great evening.